right, good evening, everybody. Once again, my name is Melissa Ziobro, and I am the Specialist Professor of Public History at Monmouth University in West Long Branch, New Jersey. And I am co-hosting this evening's event for the Princeton Preservation Group. I have just a few small technical announcements before I turn things over to my co-host. And that is, please note that we are recording this for playback. It'll be linked on the Princeton Preservation Group's webpage. So if you wanna keep your camera off or change your name so you are cloaked in anonymity, please take a moment to do that. <laughs> also, please ensure that you remain muted if you're not speaking, just so we can cut down on that background noise. Okay, thank you for that. And uh, with those brief announcements, I will then turn things over to my co-host, Gary Suretsky, who is the president of Princeton Preservation Group who's going to tell you all about tonight's exciting content. So Gary, go ahead. So good evening, everyone, and thank you for joining us. Um, before introducing our speaker, I would just like to mention that the Princeton Preservation Group has been uh, meeting since 1983 on a wide variety of preservation-related topics. It has nothing to do with the preservation of Princeton. Uh, the group began in Princeton, and that's why it has that name. Uh, if uh, you have an idea for a presentation or you know of somebody who you think would be a good presenter on a preservation-related topic, uh, please let us know. Uh, our meetings are always open to the public and free to attend. You can, however, become a member for $5 a year. And uh, there's information about membership on our webpage, and then you would be on our, our mailing list and be sure to hear about all of our events. It's now my pleasure to introduce our speaker tonight, uh, Dr. David Wolf. He's going to talk to us on the topic that you see on the screen, so I, I don't have to tell you about that. I'll just mention that uh, Dr. Wolf has taught at the Cornell Medical School since 1984 and has been an attending physician at New York Presbyterian Hospital since uh, 1984 as well. He's published numerous scientific papers on hematology and medical journals, but he's also a, a bibliophile. He's a member of the Grolier Club and uh, he knows a lot about books. So um, it's my pleasure now to introduce our speaker, Dr. David Wolf. Well, uh, uh, thank you, Gary. Good evening, everybody. Um, I want to thank you, uh, you, Gary, and the organizers for uh, inviting me tonight to present some historical information regarding bookworms and Sir William Osler's interest in bookworms. My only disclosure is that I collect antiquarian medical books and off prints, including Osleriana. And shown here is a, a portion of my collection. Since this is a, a New Jersey uh, centric group and my presentation doesn't involve New Jersey, I'd like to preface my remarks by briefly mentioning a William Osler, New Jersey co connection, so as not to disregard the Garden State and New Jerseyites. When Osler lived and worked in Philadelphia, he made multiple house calls to Camden, New Jersey, where one of his most famous patients, the poet Walt Whitman resided after having suffered a series of strokes. Whitman and Osler befriended each other and developed a nuanced relationship. If anyone in the audience is interested, I recommend an enjoyably readable book shown here authored by a professor of literature, Philip Leon, published in 1995. Walt Whitman actually predicted that Osler would, uh, quote, get very famous at his trade um, and Whitman died in 1892, one month after the first printing of Osler's medical textbook, The Principles and Practice of Medicine, which started Osler actually on the road to fame. When hearing the name William Osler, most people in medicine 
Think of the originator of bedside ward rounds or a master clinician, a medical humanist, or one of the founders of Johns Hopkins Hospital or Medical School. But tonight, I'm going to discuss William Osler, the bibliophile, and his interest in bookworms of both the insect and human varieties. The genesis of this talk began with my acquisition of a lot of Osler off prints at a James Tate Goodrich auction last April. Jim Goodrich was a friend, colleague, bookseller, and world famous pediatric neurosurgeon who tragically died owing to COVID-19 early during the pandemic in March of 2020. I'd like to dedicate this presentation to Jim. This is the off-print wrapper that caught my fancy, entitled Illustrations of the Bookworm, published in the Bodleian Quarterly Record in 1917, two years before Osler's death. So William Osler is one of the very few physicians to have published articles about both the insect and human varieties of bookworm. Warning, you may find some images at the end of this presentation abhorrent. And another disclosure is that the term bookworm is a misnomer and doesn't actually specify a type of worm. In fact, these creatures aren't worms at all. The name generically describes a variety of insect species such as beetles. So let's now focus on Osla the bibliophile. This is the title page of the catalog of Osla's world-class collection of medical books and manuscripts, Bibliotheca Oslariana, published in 1929, a decade after his death. On the left, you see Dr. William Willoughby Francis, the primary editor of the Bibliotheca Oslariana, with his younger assistant, Reginald Hill, on the right, both working on the catalog in Osler's home in Oxford, where the collection is located. A little known fact is that Osler had a secret hiding place for special books, which you don't see here. It has been speculated that he used this hiding place to keep some of his more extravagant acquisition secret from his wife, Grace Heroes, who times expressed her displeasure with regard to her husband's book collecting obsession. The catalog was published posthumously by Clarendon Press at Oxford in the UK in 1929 and contains more than 7,700 titles. And to quote Osler, a good library says a lot about the mind of the collector. His library and catalog did just that. Uh, as edited by uh, Dr. Francis and R.H. Hill, who you just saw in, in the uh, previous slide, it, there was assistance by uh, T.A. Malak, L.L. L. Mackle, and J.F. Fulton, who I'll discuss in a few moments. Osler bequeathed his collection to McGill University. The collection comprises the bulk of what is now the Osler Library of the History of Medicine at McGill, which you see on the upper right. Each entry reflects careful scholarship. Many annotations express Osler's personal comments. The catalog is comprised of eight sections. Shown here are the catalogs sections. As an overview, the, the structure is modeled after John Ferguson's Bibliotheca Chemica. And the primer section, the first section, constitutes the core of the collection containing a biobibliographical account of science and med medicine. And ma manuscripts comprise only 2% of all the entries. Shown here is an example of one of Osler's annotations in the primer section, as pointed to by the white arrow, which you can see here. 
regarding an entry of a journal article by John Hunter, a notable 18th century British surgeon. Quote, he was one of those extremely rare characters who appear only at very long intervals and who, when they do appear, remodel the fabric of knowledge. They revolutionize our modes of thought, they stir up the intellect of insurrection, and they are rebels and demagogues of science. John F. Fulton, one of Harvey Cushing's neurosurgical residents, a notable medical historian who worked on Osler's catalog, tells the story of its creation following Osler's death. In his will, Sir William appointed Dr. William Willoughby Francis, the older gentleman who you saw in the photo, as the librarian of the collection. Although Sir, Sir William worked on the catalog from 1914 until his death in 1919, Many annotations were not written owing to World War I and his son's death. W. W. Francis started working on the catalog in 1922. He was the ultimate workaholic and perfectionist. Until its completion in 1929, seven years later, he worked for the entire seven year period, 14 to 16 hours a day, and took only one vacation during the seven year period. Reginald H. Hale, the younger helper at the Bodleian Library, began assisting him on the catalog in 1915. And uh, Archibald Malik also assisted working on the binding manuscripts and index. During this time, Malik fell in love with an assistant, Miss Catherine Abbott, a daughter of Sir William's niece. And he later became librarian at the New York Academy of Medicine. The Oxford unit the University Press charged Osler's estate 1,739 pounds for producing 750 copies of the catalog. Upon completion of the catalog, the collection was shipped to McGill University, where the collection, as I showed you earlier, is now located. Osler was a notorious prankster. In his essay entitled Sir William Osler as a Bibliophile, L.L. Mackle, who worked on the catalog and was a noted bibliographer of his day, writes as seen here in the red box, quote, once at the New York Academy of Medicine, a librarian asked him, referring to Osler, to write his name in the register and was later much surprised to find instead as written, Miss Persimmons written in a well-known hand. Arlene Shainer, the current uh, New York Academy of Medicine librarian, however, has, despite her clearly in effort, not been able to locate this register. Osler's Medica, medical incunabula collection, including items from 1467 to 1480 was also published posthumously in a separate catalog in 1923 in Cannabula Medica, published by the Bibliographical Society of London, of which Osler was the president until his death in 1919. A book printed before 1501, as you uh, may know, is designated an incunabula from the Latin word meaning swaddling clothes or cradle, referring to the birth and infancy of printing. Osler's most insightful comment regarding his medical incunabula catalog is, quote, incunable medical books tell us much about the state in medicine during the Middle Ages, but did little to advance medical science. Without going into detail, the only comment I'll make about the Incunabula Medica is that it's prima facie evidence of Osler's bibliophilia. For those of you interested in learning more about Osler, last year, Jeremy Norman published an approximately 2,000 page encyclopedia edited by Charles Bryan, which includes just about anything you could possibly want to know about Osler. So now let's switch focus and consider insect bookworms, which I suspect some in the audience have had some personal experience. Out of 
Aristotle in History of Animals described creatures resembling a scorpion found within the pages of books. Here is shown an illustration of how a later scholar interpreted Aristotle's description. Some highlights in insect bookworm history include that in 1744, the Real Society of Gottingen offered a prize for the individual who could describe the greatest number of insects causing damage to books and recommending the best defense against these pests. In 1900, an International Library Congress in Paris offered a 1,000 franc Marie Pellichet Prize for the best essay on bookworms. And more recently, in 1911, Brooklyn Institute of Arts and Sciences held an exhibit entitled Enemy of Books. Three notable books concerning insect bookworms published during the late 19th and early 20th century are listed here. I have them all in my collection and the three authors are William Blades, Claude Hubert, and Reverend O'Connor. And I'll show you each book now. William Blades, The Enemies of Books, published in 1880, includes a chapter discussing damage by bookworms. On the right, I show you an advertisement because of its intricate and pleasing graphic design. On the left, you see the frontispiece portrait illustration of John Backford, who after failing in the shoemaking business became a prosperous and well-known bookseller. He had many famous clients and specialized in fragments of old books and manuscripts. He had a reputation of cutting leaves, ergo his reputation as per this frontispiece portrait as a bibliophilist. He was an enemy of books. The second book by Claude Hubert in French published in 1903 is quite detailed, but the illustrations of insects were more like drawings and not very realistic. Hubert, by the way, won the 1,000 franc Pellet prize that I mentioned just a moment ago. The, the last of the three books by Reverend S.J.X. Uh, O'Connor, published in 1898, Facts About Bookworms, is the least interesting of the three books and rather pedestrian. Shown here is the dust jacket of a used 1956 entomology textbook, which I purchased for $3 to learn more about entomology. After skimming through the text, I decided that I didn't want to learn much more than the little I already knew, especially not about the approximate 250,000 species of beetles worldwide. I settled for learning the minimum knowledge required to appreciate Osler's illustration of a bookworm, which was essentially the life cycle of these creatures. Shown here is the life cycle of a, of a beetle. The adult beetle here on the far right lays eggs, which you can see here on the far left. Uh, larvae then hatch as voracious eaters from the eggs and they grow in size and they travel through books, tunneling and crawling on the pages, eating just about anything they encounter. The larvae, which look like maggots, then pupate, forming a cocoon from frass, consisting of paper dust and their excrement. The adult, which you see here again, emerges from the pupa case just as a butterfly emerges from the cocoon made by a caterpillar. With this background, now let's look at Osler's bookworm illustration, the centerpiece of this presentation. In October 1915, quoting Osler, I received from a Paris bookseller, Monsieur Lucien Gougy, three volumes of the Histoire Abrégée de la Dernière Persecution de Port Royal. Please uh, excuse my bad French accent. The back of the volume 
too, was wormed with 10 holes. When I opened this volume, it showed a single tunnel, one and a half inches in length, which you can see here, uh, with side tunnels. It, and the, the borings also had a fresh look and there were many granular casings. From the upper end of the tunnel, a brownish black head bobbed in and out, right from this place here. And with gentle manipulation, I extracted the little worm. The larva in its actual size is seen near the top of the upper right-hand tunnel, which I'm pointing to, with a yellowish white glistening body covered with fine soft hairs. Its enlarged size is seen here in figure three, and with its mandibles here, which are used for chewing. In figure five, uh, you can see the actual size of the, the beetle. Uh, and in 5A, it's, it's magnified. Uh, here, uh, in figure four is the pupa case in its actual size. And here it's magnified. Os Osla was so astonished by seeing this living, moving lava that he showed it to Professor Poulton at Oxford, who urged him to have a sketch made by the well-known artist, Mr. Horace Knight of the British Museum. Mr. Knight's beautiful sketches were so superior to anything previously published in the literature that Mr. Mann, chief editor of the Bodleian Quarterly Record, calmly consented to have the plate reproduced and published. The first known realistic illustration of a bookworm is found in Robert Hooke's well-known book, Micrographia, published in 1665. Here you see his illustration on the left. For comparison, I show a photo on the right taken from the web with remarkable similarity to Hooke's illustration. Hooke writes and describes the, the silverfish as shown in the red box. It's a small white silver shining worm or moth, which I found much conversant among books and papers. And it's supposed to be that which corrodes and eats holes through the leaves and covers. It appears to the naked eye, a small glittering pearl colored moth. Its head appears big and blunt and its body tapers towards the tail, smaller and smaller, being shaped almost like a carrot. At the end of the, this presentation, I'll show you some hard examples of damage by bookworms. But first I'd like to mention that these insects create a variety of destructive patterns shown here on, on the left-hand column. And they devour not only paper, but just about anything from which books are fabricated, which are listed here in the middle column. And that there are many different species of these critters, which we call bookworms, which you can see here uh, in, in the right-hand column. Uh, William R. Renneke, a New York public librarian, 1903, studied and identified approximately 160 different kinds of bookworms. There have been many poems written about insect bookworms. The one I like the best is by Robert Burns, the notable Scottish poet. He wrote the following quatrain on a flyleaf and a copy of a Shakespeare, which he described as, quote, splendidly bound in gilt, but unread and wormy, which he found in a notable person's library. I'll read it to you now. Through and through the inspired leaves, ye maggots make your winding, but I'll respect his lordship's taste and spare his golden bindings. Now let's focus on bookworms of the human variety. Here you see an illustration of a specimen of a human bookworm. Genus and species Homo sapiens, subspecies Bookwormus. Uh, 
Osler's nom de plume was Egerton York Davis Jr. As I mentioned earlier, Osler was a notorious prankster. He wrote articles that were spoofs Im imagining absurdly fallacious medical diagnoses and jests. And he also enjoyed fabricating ludicrous bookish topics. An unpublished manuscript of one of these spoofs was found in the Osler collection of McGill during the 1990s. As shown here, the title page and his frontispiece portrait of a pamphlet entitled Borrowings of a Bookworm, published for the members of the Zamorano and Roxburgh Clubs, for a meeting held in 2000 in Pasadena, California. Osler was a self diagnosed bibliomaniac. As background, Thomas Frognell Dibnin, who you see on the left, and John Ferriar on the right, both famously wrote about bibliomania. I read you from the first paragraph of Osler's Borrowing of a Bookworm in the Red Box. Apologia. In the final stage of the malady, sung of so sweetly by John Ferriar and described so minutely by Dibnin, the bibliomaniac haunts the auction rooms and notes with envious eyes the precious volumes as they are handed about for inspection, or chortles with joy as he hears the bids rise higher and higher for some precious treasure already in his possession. Of this final enthralled of the chief symptom, not mentioned indeed by Dibden, is the daily perusal of the catalogs of auction sales, caring nothing for the new announcements of Mr. Murray, uh, Houghton Mifflin, he skips to the advertising pages of the Spectator of the Anthenaeum or the Nation, and having long since abandoned the book lover's library and stopping at the Times Book Club in all his spare moments. So here's the final warning. Some of the following images are extremely abhorrent. Many types of book damage are shown here, including tunneling, devouring edges of leaves, and chewing large areas of paper. On the upper left, you see two leaves of a Caxton destroyed. Early printed books from the 15th century, which were often made of red paper, and the 16th century books, mostly made of wood pulp paper, are particularly vulnerable. Worms find books left, at, left, left Excuse me. Worms find books less appetizing, which were made during and after the mid 19th century with paper containing adulterants such as bleaches and plaster. Here you see the tunneling created by a voracious lava. The world's record for the longest tunnel is through 27 volumes of adjacent books and their covers in a straight line made by one single worm, a miracle of gluttony. Shown here is damaged by a silverfish, previously shown uh, as illustrated by Robert Hook, seemingly drunk, meandering around while gorging on paper. Silverfish particularly enjoy starchy materials, preferring glossy paper and photographic film. Shown here is staining by book lice, which are not the kind of lice that infects humans causing disease. On the left is major destruction of a leather binding and spine. And on the right is a solitary hole, the end of a tunnel made by a lava. And finally, shown here is a termite generated excavation. Termites are the homes of the insect world. As well as enjoying wood, they also feast on paper produced during the 19th and 20th centuries made with fillers. Owing to parasites in their intestinal tracts, which break down cellulose, termites can live and prosper on a cellulose only diet. Many in the audience are a great deal more knowledgeable, I presume, about the prevention and management of pest infestations than me. 
I presume many of you are familiar with the Northeast Document Conservation Center, NDCC, whose preservation leaflet found on their website reviews and describes in detail methods of pest management. I'm grateful to Nicole Milano, the head archivist at the archives at New York Presbyterian Wild Cornell Medical Center for making you aware of this nonprofit organization. This is not a solicitation. I recently purchased archival boxes from Gaylord Archival, the storage of medical offerings, only to receive this email promoting the sale of ways to identify and trap all kinds of insect, insect pests totaling about 80 different products. I must presume that bookworms remain a current and fairly widespread problem since there is obviously a market for all these products to prevent and annihilate pest infest infestations. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Wolf. Uh, will you be available to answer a few questions? Sure. Uh, if somebody would like to uh, ask a question, you could unmute or uh, you could also uh, put a question in the chat and uh, we'll convey it. We have one comment in the chat. What wonderful pictures of bibliomastication. <laughs> well, um, could I ask a, a question in, in your collection? Have you found any insects, Dr. Wolf? Well, I, uh, not, not, no live insects. That's good. And I, and I think uh, generally speaking, you know, um, uh, in, in, insects were more prevalent uh, when, you know, there was, uh, kind of construction of, of libraries uh, that weren't as uh, well, well uh, constructed in the past to, you know, uh, to, to prevent uh, insects. Uh, the, uh, and more modern books uh, are not as appetizing to, to, to insects, but um, the, uh, and so I, I think it's it's pretty unusual now to actually find a living insect, but many old books uh, or worm uh, that that are you know found uh, throughout the world, uh, and uh, uh, there, there's also foxing, which is very common. Which foxing actually is not from insects. That's uh, you know, this brownish discoloration, which is due to uh, uh, yeast, which, uh, which actually uh, 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 lives on, on, on paper and uh, exposes the iron. So that's why it's that darker brown color. Um, and uh, it's interesting that if you, if you uh, read about uh, forged, old books or, or books that were uh, made uh, to look old. Uh, they're actually, uh, one of the ways uh, that forges did that was they actually with a hot awl created phony uh, uh, wormholes. Hmm. Interesting. Um, I, I know in, in, in my own house, I don't have, I haven't found any insects, live insects in, in, in my own books, but uh, where I worked, uh, we, we acquired a lot of books from that had been stored in a warehouse, uh, unheated, unair conditioned, um, in some places, uh, dirt floor, uh, leaky roof. Uh, and these books were stored there for decades. And, there was a lot of insect damage there. Some of the books were half eaten, um, lot, lots of holes in them. And we had to get them all uh, fumigated and uh, treated, you know, to, to eliminate that before we could bring them into the archives. So they, they do turn up these things. 
anybody else have any questions? Uh, we have a we have a question from Brian. Uh, am I correct in thinking that these insects can chew through wooden bookshelves as well? I'm thinking historic house libraries. I, I would think that termites uh, certainly could uh, chew through wooden bookshelves, but um, do you have any further information on that? Uh? Well, yes. Um, I mean, not, not only do they uh, destroy the, the wooden bookshelves, but as you know, uh, old books, the boards were actually made of wood also, not like today. Um, and uh, in uh, tropical areas, uh, uh, termites not only would go through the bookshelves, they don't actually destroy the building. Bring the whole building down with the books. Yeah. Or, what, or what's left of them. Uh, there's also a question from Michael. Any sense if more recent vintage office notepaper, notebook paper is also less appetizing to insects? I think he did say that that was the, the case already. Yeah. I think Bruce Fye is, 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 is trying to show us something. I, I would like, to, yeah, I'm Bruce Fye, and I think uh, I have to explain why the name comes up David Wolf with my picture. Uh, I hacked into his account and actually emptied his bank accounts while he was giving this talk. So I just wanted to confess that for a bit. <laughs> no, seriously. Uh, I, you're the, I you're I was, the worm that did that. Huh? I thought I had signed up for this but I couldn't find a link. So I emailed David about 30 minutes before the talk and he was kind enough to send me a link, but it's obviously connected to him. So <laughs> I enjoyed the talk very, very much, David. I'll just say one quick thing about, have you ever received books with, with live bookworms? And uh, having received thousands of books through the mail for a period of over 50 years in Baltimore in about 1967, or well, I guess about 1972 or three, uh, I got a box of books from Florida and I opened them and lo and behold, there were uh, some living bookworms in them. So I wrapped them up and sent them back to the person that sent them to me. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks again, David. Terrific presentation. Thanks for loaning me your name. Thank, thank you for the explanation of why there were two Davids. <laughs> uh, Kelly asks uh, that uh, she's heard that, oh, I assume, Kelly is a female, I'm not sure. Uh, I've heard that for books with wooden boards, beech wood was much more vulnerable to bookworms than oak. Have you run across this? Uh, not not uh, particularly, uh, but uh, uh, what what's, what's seems uh, uh, interesting is that there are a whole variety of different kinds of beetles. Uh, you know that that uh, that can uh, cause book destruction, and uh, di different insects favor different uh, materials. Mm -hmm. So some some uh, will uh, favor you know uh, uh, some a glossy paper or or with more starch in the paper, and others might uh, uh, you know. Uh, uh, favor uh, different materials. So I wouldn't be surprised if, uh, uh, you know, like I mentioned, there's there at least uh, have been described uh, at least 160 different kinds of insects. Um, and uh, for instance, cockroaches, um, uh, uh, they, they like cloth books, cloth bound books, bindings uh, that have colors. And what the cockroaches live on is, is the pigments in, in, in the, the actual cloth bindings. So they, they don't destroy the bindings, they just discolor it because they like the pigments. Anybody else? Melissa, I have a question for you. In your experience at Fort Monmouth, uh, did you find any problems with, uh, with insects in your collections? I don't recall um, that we ever did. Of course, you know, it's 
quite some time ago now, <laughs> but no, I don't recall that we ever did. Okay. How about you at the Monmouth County Archives? Well, as I just mentioned a little while ago, we, we took over a large quantity of records from a warehouse. Okay, okay, but in there. Really, really bad storage conditions. Okay. And, um, but other than that, no. They never snuck into your facility? No, just, you know, once in a while we'd see something and we'd catch it, but that was it. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. a, a few other interesting things was Osler actually, after he removed the bookworm that I mentioned, the lava, kept it in, in a jar and, and uh, he was very proud of that and anybody who would come into his library he would be sure to show them the worm <laughs> uh, and, and uh, there's also one kind of beetle it's called the death watch beetle which in the uh, uh, 16th and 17th centuries did a lot of damage and the interesting thing about that was it, it made noises, clicking noises, so that uh, uh, you could uh, you could hear the, the the beetle as he was chewing, so to speak, uh, or whatever he was eating. Uh, now, one of the issues with 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 the the uh, some some of the insects, they the, they will only first. Uh, invade and damage and destroy the inside of the book, not the outer covers. And those are the kind that, that go less, less easily detected uh, because it requires opening the book to see that there's been some damage done. I, I guess we should also mention, you know, that often the, the typical treatment for these things is freezing. Mm -hmm. um, and then, you know, books are, have to be put into a, a sealed package and frozen. And then when they're taken out, um, they're acclimatized gradually so that no condensation forms on the inside of the package. Um, but that, that's a typical method. They, they used to do a lot of um, fumigation with uh, different chemicals that have, were then found to be carcinogenic. Uh, so they stopped that. Uh, Princeton University, for example, had a chamber in which they used to fumigate uh, everything that came in the door, uh, but it left residues which would then be exposed to uh, researchers. So then those residues presumably are still on those materials, but uh, <laughs> they stopped doing that some time ago. I, yeah, this is Mike Andrick. Uh, um, I was doing some research a while ago about silverfish, uh, looking through what's been published and I saw something to the effect that they can actually produce what they call antifreeze proteins. So some, some species actually produce a protein that prevents them from freezing. And so the key thing from what I understand for silverfish is that you have to, you have to put them into a really cold freezer so that the temperature drops very quickly before they have a chance to produce the antifreeze protein. <laughs> so... Just a word to the wise. Thanks for uh, sharing that. Of course, catching them, you know, just physically is often recommended as the easiest way to get rid of them if you don't have too many of them. Where, where I worked, uh, we had glue strips uh, at all the entrances to the facilities, so that would catch anything that was crawling into the building. I just okay. dropped uh, one of the resources from the Northeast Document Conservation Center in okay. the chat if anyone's looking for a little light reading on bugs before bed tonight. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, I, if there's no more questions, I guess we could wrap this up. I just want to re repeat uh, that uh, we're looking for more speakers and if anybody has uh, a topic they would like to present or know of somebody they recommend, uh, please keep us in mind. I would be happy to uh, consider it. Okay, we all set then, Gary? I guess so. I guess so. Thank you, Melissa, for your role in making this a success. And thank you, Dr. Wolf, for your excellent presentation. Thank you for inviting me.
Yes, thank you so much, Dr. Wolf, and uh, have a great night, everyone. Remember, if you would like to share this talk with anyone else, it will be linked on Princeton Preservation Group's webpage shortly for anyone who might have missed it. Okay, have a great night, all. Bye.